Uh, my name is James Peltier, and I am here to tell you about what happened at Woodstock 50 years ago. James, let's get this out of the way. Because <laughs> everybody wants to know. Obviously, you didn't have a good time, right? Because you remember everything. <laughs> Uh, no, not really. I, uh, first, let me go on record. Um, I have to. I have to own this. I am. Uh, I'm opposed to the legalization of marijuana, but uh, probably for reasons that most people would not think of. So I will share that with you later on. So, um, having said that, I spent a lot of time being stoned at Woodstock. Yeah. <laughs> so there are gaps <laughs> in my memory. Okay, so Russell Stoddard was 32 years old. I was 18. He and I were house painters together. And uh, on, fr on that Friday, we were up on the ladders, and there were ads coming over the radio about Woodstock, and I'm like begging pleading I'm just like whining that please let's go let's go let's go let's go and I was I we were in Jaffrey New Hampshire which is a long way from Woodstock and uh, so he, uh, Russell Stoddard um, uh, was an alcoholic and was a so-so artist uh, he was a protege of Jan Cox, who was a very famous uh, artist in Belgium. And he had gone to uh, the MFA in Boston and went to the Art Students League in New York and then spent, uh, he was a, a real beatnik, the real, real McCoy, like Jack Kerouac beatnik. And uh, he had bummed around in, uh, Europe on a motorcycle and worked his way down to North Africa and got a job being Peter O'Toole's body double in the movie Lawrence of Arabia. So if you see in Lawrence of Arabia, when Peter O'Toole is supposedly like on the camel, <laughs> that's actually Russell started. Then he came around and went up into Spain and they were making spaghetti westerns. So he made it, he, he was in a couple of films. Uh, the Thin Red Line was one of his films. And he, he just had this, this like uh, crazy life that, that beatniks had. So, since it was an art fair, that was part of my pitch. <laughs> was, but it's an art fair, you can like bring your paintings. <laughs> right? Like that was like one of the cons I was like, I was angling this from, I like, <laughs> I'm thinking like, what do I need to say to get this guy to bring me to Woodstock? <laughs> so, um, so we went and uh, so I finally, Friday afternoon, I finally talked him into it, get down off the ladders, we're cleaning up the paintbrushes, and while we're putting the, the ladder into the, the van, the ladder breaks the passenger side window. And I go, I am fucked, this is over, I'm, I'm not going. But there was this place called Letourneau's Used Auto Parts which is also the title of a book of a friend of mine, Carolyn Chute, who wrote, wrote a book called The Turners uh, Use Auto Parts, so that's kind of funny. Uh, so I, I said, I, you know, we can do this. <laughs> we'll go, we're gonna find this. Karma was right, the stars were right, everything, all the planets were aligned. We went to uh, Letourneau's Used Auto Parts, he had a window. We popped it out, put the new one in, we got like a carton of cigarettes. I had these old K rations, uh, you know, a couple of bottles of water, whatever, and we were on our way. And it was still light out. So we worked our way. I, I can't remember how we got, I think we took either Route 9 across southern Vermont or Route 2 over to um, New York. And we hit the New York State. Uh, highway and we got down there before they closed the exit so that was like everything I mean you know, like <laughs> every, everything that needed to happen happened to get me there and it was Russell started he died in 2002 uh, he uh, all I can say is he he was and he is probably the only 
real authentic beatnik I ever knew personally. In my experience, it was really funny because I was sitting up on top of the the, the, um, the bus, and the, the, there was this woman who came by, and I was 18 years old, so um, and she wanted to sit up on the bus, and so she did, and she was she was older than I was, and she wanted to have sex with me, but it was I don't know, it was just the funniest thing. It just didn't. It just, there was something wrong about it. Just like she was older and um, she wasn't like cougar age, but she was borderline MILF, <laughs> you know? So, right, so, you know, so then I was 18. So, um, so I could have had sex, but I didn't. And I don't know if it was because I was stoned, I don't know what it was, but it just didn't feel right. The thing about 400,000 people sitting together, right? And it's in this absolutely beautiful place. I mean, there's a lake out there. There's a beautiful forest, right? And uh, everybody's high, and the sun is setting, and the stars are coming up, and the lights go out because it's dark. So if you put that many people together who are high in the dark, somebody's going to have sex. Nudity was um, common, uh, uh, and depending on the time, because after a couple of days, myself included, you, you feel filthy. So you want to rinse off, and you got to take your clothes off to go rinse off. Uh, I, I, where I was on the bus, Behind behind the bus was uh, a little a little forest area that had a stream that went through it, and so people would just take their clothes off, get in the, the stream, and rinse off and, and come out. Uh, that, that's during the daytime. Uh, for myself, <laughs> all right, I'll tell you. All right, so you have to understand where I I was sitting. Uh, so I'm sitting on top of a white VW microbus uh, at the far end of the, the, the right end of the stage. So I'm on the bus sitting here, but I can look down at what people are doing. Right? So I'm like a voyeur. I can see this. And one of the things I ha that happened was I was looking down and I had n I'd seen lesbian sex on porn films, but I, but I had never seen it live, <laughs> right? So I'm looking at these two girls like kissing and fun, and I'm going, oh man. So this is the sort of thing that, that was, would happen, right? Because people are that close together and people are affectionate and people touch each other and that was what happened. But we mentioned earlier about um, being against legalization of marijuana. Yes, I think I, that's interesting from somebody coming from Woodstock. Can you, you know, yes. extrapolate on uh, that? It's a very serious question. This is very serious. I'm going to get serious here. Okay. Uh, our country uh, is has become dependent on oil. You cannot get a job. You cannot do anything without a car. You have to have oil. Then people started to become addicted to television, and it changed American life. Where you, the, where you had couch potatoes, people who just sat in front of television all day long. Then what we're dealing with now is that the obvious addiction is uh, heroin. Uh, but there is a, an addiction to repetitive behavior, which people uh, habitually are on their uh, phone, their, their cell phone, this habitual texting. And people of my generation who are, uh, are now addicted to the pharmaceutical industry, uh, it, you know, there's two sides to this. Uh, I'm alive because of pharmaceuticals. But for people my age, 
we are addicted to medication, uh, blood pressure, uh, you know, you, you name it, somebody over 65 has taken something. So you have, you have these parallel dependencies, right? You have an addiction to oil. You cannot live without it. You are addicted to communication. You cannot function without it, right? You're addicted to these cell phones. You are addicted to drugs. So there is a, we are in this phase of dependency. And so medical marijuana is fine. But if, if you give somebody another reason to become dependent on something, marijuana, to me, it's it just one more thing on a whole line of dependencies. And that's why I'm opposed to the legalization of marijuana. Uh, so what would you say was your most memorable moment at Woodstock? Uh, there are two. Um, it was... <laughs> it was when um, Mr. Yaskertz came out on the stage and he said, I am a farmer. And that was... That was like your father coming out on stage and saying, all you kids are okay. You're all right. You're good. And, um, and he, 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 was, he was a farmer and he was a, a very short haired, you know, clean cut guy, he had a work, you know, farming clothes on, and we're all out there, and we got hair down in here, and funny colored clothes, and we're stoned, and um, it was just, it was just this thing, it was, you know, he just came out, and it was just something ab about that moment that I had worked on a farm when I was a kid, so I knew farmers very well, and um, it was just like, it was like a grown-up. He was like the grown-up in, <laughs> he was the grown-up in the, in the whole place. And he was, he came out and he said, you kids are okay. You're good kids. And uh, that, that was really unforgettable. And, um, and then and the other one, which had a great influence on my art, was, uh, I, I honestly, I don't remember what night it was, <laughs> but it was night. <laughs> and somebody came on the stage and said, I want you all, and everybody, since you smoke marijuana, you all had matches, said, I want everybody to light one match. So we all took out matches and we all hit that, our, lit our, our match stick. I don't know how long a match stick lasts, maybe, 60 seconds. I mean, I don't know how long that thing lasts, but that whole hill just slowly, like stars, started to light up. And within 30 seconds, that whole hill was just a field of light. And I have never seen anything like it in my life, ever before or since it because i was sitting up on the on the on the bus and 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 so this so i'm on the bus this the wall to the stage is here and the speakers are there and everybody's here and the hill goes like this and it was just this whole hill just <laughs> lit up for like 30, 60 seconds, and then it was gone, just like that. And so the, the idea was is that you could have this a phenomenal, amazing experience that was not permanent.
There are only two situations that I've ever been in since Woodstock, which that had um, something s that the the vibe, the feel that was there. Uh, and they, uh, it's uh, when you're in church, and um, and when you're in a movie theater. That the the communal uh, uh, a sense. And remember, there are no cell phones, oh, theoretically. There are supposed to be no cell phones uh, in movie theaters and no cell phones in church. So, so that's the, the, the part of it that made it a communal event was that there were, there were cell phones and uh, electronics and uh, all those things did not exist. And so all we had to relate to is each other. So, and th that, when you're in a movie theater and you're looking at a movie theater and you're all laughing together and you're all crying together and you know, whatever that was, that, that, that sense of being together and you're being entertained, right? So you have a focal point, the screen, or in this case at Woodstock, it was music, and that shared communal experience um, church and, uh, and and the movie theater are the only two ti times the only two places where I have sat and said yeah this just kind of feels like this is what it felt like to be you know to be connected to a, a whole group of people spontaneously applauding or laughing with no distractions that, you know, like there was nobody with a cell phone, nobody, you know, no, nothing buzzing, nothing, you know, anything like that. And it was, it, and, and, and it was, and it, like a church or a, a movie theater, they had, it, it, even though it was, it was outdoors, it had a feeling of being contained. There was, there was a feeling that you were sort of separated from the rest of the world. You were in this like little cocoon type of thing. One of the funny things about Woodstock was there are two types of people who went to Woodstock. There were the people who went to Woodstock and there are people who stayed to see Hendrix. So there were like something like 400,000 people there, but only 10,000 of us stayed to see Hendrix. And so I'm laying in the, <laughs> I'm laying in the front of the, what, the bus, right? And I'm, I'm, and I'm sleeping, and it's like morning, and my eyes are like, uh, like <laughs> opening, and I hear this old time '50s rock and roll, and, and, and I say to start it, I say, turn that fucking radio off. You sound like the fucking AM music, and he says, it's, it's not the radio, and I sit up. And on stage in gold lame is Shanana. <laughs> Eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and I'm going, oh, I'm going, oh man, no, no, this can't. <laughs> but he, they were followed by Hendrix. And I stayed on that bus. I didn't go like, very far from that bus at all. And I went out and I stood out in the mud. I walked out into that mud to see Hendrix. And I can still see him in my mind just like I was there that day. And he played the Star Spangled Banner. And to me, that probably, in uh, that um, moment was probably an expression of one of America's greatest moments of artistic freedom. I think that that moment really uh, earned itself a place in cultural history of our country. Not just, not just musical history, but American history. But the reason, one of the reasons we stayed was because there was so much mud, the bus bottomed out inside the mud. So we were in mud. <laughs> we had to push the van, the bus sideways 
we had that we had we had to push it sideways until the, the the wheels would catch dirt and then it would sort of spin and we had like guys like pushing the, the bus like around like this until we until the tires finally caught some dirt and we could like move out the people who were at Woodstock were primarily white middle class kids and what's really kind of creeped me out the other day is that if you look at the, the scenes of Woodstock, today probably I would say 20% of those people are dead. And half of those people are over 70 because this is 50 years ago. So just statistically, people have this idea of Woodstock and there's this like perpetual youth and energy. <laughs> we got old. <laughs> You know, that's, that's what happened.